goes. So it is every one who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved this world that God gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. You can see that I picked a, um, those who are gathered here and those who are on video, you can see I picked a art piece to go along with this sermon. What is it called? Starry Night by Van Gogh. So it's a pretty popular um, piece, and one of the reasons I picked this in particular is because our gospel starts in the night and ends in the night. In the night, a respected leader traveled to a spot where he knew a controversial teacher and leader was staying. In the night, this Pharisee, Nicodemus, ventured out of his comfort zone to go and ask this infamous preacher, Jesus, a few questions. Why do you think, and I want you to actually answer this one, why do you think Nicodemus went to go visit Jesus in the night? So no one would see him. That's the great answer. Everyone <laughs> else is like, Gigi said it. We, that's correct. <laughs> that would be a really good reason for Nicodemus, this person who was well-respected and well-known, to go and walk to be with someone that he thought and people thought he was supposed to hate, but he had questions and he wanted to be able to ask them. And so he went in the cover of darkness. It made it less conspicuous. And I, I want to imagine that they were kind of by a fire and they got to ask some hard questions. They weren't rushed. They had nothing else to do that evening besides talk with each other and figure out more pieces of truth by asking questions. Being underneath a night sky is common ground where people can ask questions that they might be afraid to speak. From our Judeo-Christian tradition, we tell a story of creation that emerges out of complete darkness. Before there was light, there was a deep, deep night. This nighttime was good and holy, and it was the place that day was created. The heavens opened up for the first dawn. This all started out of darkness. And this conversation that Nicodemus embarks on is not the first time that someone has gone and traveled underneath a night sky and met God. Night is where Jacob meets God in the desert and wrestles with God all night and won't let go of God, challenging God to give Jacob answers that he so desperately wanted. And Jacob leaves that fight after a whole night and is forever changed. He has a limp in his hip to prove it. And in the night, the prophet Samuel is called by God out of his bed, and he keeps mistaking God's call for his teacher, Eli. And 
Samuel finally learns that it's Yahweh who is calling out to him. And then Samuel takes on a posture of listening in that night to pay attention to what God needs him to do. Night is sacred. Night is a space where the judgments of broad daylight or society's pressures to be who we think the world needs us to be have fallen away. Night is a good place for questions, and night is a holy ground for transformation and creation. Night can also be a time when our internal inhibitions are lowered and we might be brave enough to name what bothers us and speak the questions on our hearts that we're too afraid to bring to the brightness of the morning. It's a lot easier to ask a question to someone in a little fireside chat in the evening than it is to say it out loud here from this pulpit. It's a lot easier to just talk one-on-one -on -one with people about the things we're unsure about. In the night, Nicodemus goes to speak with Jesus, and he comes with a posture of respect, which he didn't necessarily have to do. He was a public figure, a Pharisee, and he comes and says, Jesus, Rabbi, you are someone who has truth. He comes with humility and respect, naming Jesus as an equal that has answered to his questions. And Nicodemus offers up question after question after question. And this discourse is quite common in rabbinical traditions because the whole focus is to keep asking and wrestling with those questions because if we keep questioning and we keep finding more questions to ask, we hope that we'll eventually get to the truth. So rabbis have been trained throughout their whole seminary time to just keep asking questions and wrestling. And so this is something that makes sense to both of these rabbis. The culmination of this conversation is Jesus proclaiming that God so loved the world that God gave their child a precious treasure, Jesus. Jesus lives among us as fully human, fully divine being in order so that we might understand more about the limitless grace that God provides to us. <laughs> See, that limitless grace right there. <laughs> we have this grace that pours out from our spirits and our creator, and it dwells within us. Love is what matters most in this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Even though Nicodemus also is told by Jesus, very truly, I tell you, you're so wrong. Even in this discussion, the quiet discourse between two people, this interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus, is shared. It becomes shared enough that it's eventually written down as so important. Why? Why is it important that this story is written down? These questions might be the exact burning questions that other people had in their hearts and in their minds when they were wondering about following Jesus. And these needed to be illuminated for more people to understand what Christianity is about. This story and the ways that Jesus describes our relationship with God is so important that it was passed on by the disciples, perhaps by Nicodemus, by the followers of Jesus. It was written down in hopes that people would understand more about God's grace. Because these people have these answers, I mean these questions that they want answers for. This summer, our church is embarking on questions and answers that will be coming from our pulpits. And it's a sermon series that's not going to be really gentle on our souls. Our worship planning team has actually been wrestling with this and wondering the best avenues for this because we're going to be walking through scriptures that Christians have used to condemn LGBTQIA people. 
We will be wrestling with this text and unpacking the historical significance and then liberating the texts so that they too can become the questions that we wrestle enough with that we can find hope in them. These texts are shied away from in our Lutheran and Episcopal context. I was actually doing some sermon prep earlier this week, and I noticed that there's not a lot of commentary on this because we never hear these texts from our pulpits. We tend to favor the in-the-night quiet wrestling by the fireside to talk about these issues because we want, we're afraid, perhaps, of having it be put in our pulpit. But like Nicodemus and Jesus' conversation that's important enough to be passed down in the Gospel of John, we too are called to give these texts enough breathing room in the light so that we can learn from them and be changed. So we give these questions, the ones that were asked in the safety of the night, we give these questions, the ones that people reach out to ask me in my Facebook Messenger, they ask me these questions and they want answers. And it's time for our pulpit to have that space. Because when we give these questions space to breathe in the light, we disassemble the power that these nagging questions have when we don't let them have space. When we put these texts in the pulpit, when we dismantle the harm that has been piled on these scriptures, we proclaim that these texts were not intended for abuse and for hurt. These texts were intended to enliven us, to inspire us, to give us deeper life with God. And there's plenty of other pulpits that are not using it for that purpose. So come, join the dance of naming the questions on our hearts that we might be too afraid to speak at 10.30 a.m. Come, wrestle with scripture texts that we might rather avoid. Come, savor and find sacredness in texts that our faith would like to gloss over or to keep in a box over there, safe and hidden. This faith is ours to own. These questions are ours to hold responsibility for. So we get to join Nicodemus on an evening walk to meet Jesus, our loving Christ, to humbly ask for guidance in proclaiming that love wins always. And then we get to take that walk with Nicodemus and say, let's keep going till there's light. Let's dance with Nicodemus in the light. Let us be unafraid of asking the tough questions that are tucked deep in our hearts. So come, wrestle with God our creator. Come, discuss with Jesus Christ our savior. And come, dance with our vibrant Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Kathy will lead us in 